but you're all ready to go if I introduce you. Is that excellent? Right. It looks like a blackboard. Um, so, uh, okay, so um, welcome everybody to this afternoon's session. Um, and the first speaker this afternoon is uh, Kirill Zednik, um, and he's going to talk about interpolation of power mappings with something that looks like a blackboard. So thank you, Kirill. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Gwyneth, and um, thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me. It's always very encouraging that people want to listen about what I'm working on, so thanks uh, for inviting me again. Uh, and yeah, this is a, a Zoom version of a Blackboard talk, I guess. So, um, right, the, the theorem that I want to talk about, uh, which is joint work with uh, Jack, so if we really zoom out, what this main theorem is doing roughly is it's this sort of thing into which we put some information and this theorem spits out an entire function. <clears throat> so uh, roughly that's what I'll be talking about. And uh, if you zoom out, this is what it says, but let's uh, give some more details. So in this case, the information that we're putting in to the theorem are two sequences. So one is a sequence of real numbers, Rj, which we'll think of as radii. And uh, by the way, if you can see something or if you have any questions, just uh, interrupt me. Um, and the other sequence is a sequence of natural numbers. And uh, both of these guys are increasing sequences. And the function that we're getting out is uh, we're going to denote by f. So it's an entire function f. And we're also going to get out a quasi conformal map phi. So if you don't know what a quasi conformal mapping is, that doesn't impede your ability to understand the talk. Just replace quasi conformal with a uh, homeomorphism of the plane, and you'll be able to understand everything just fine. Um, so what uh, the relation is to these sequences that we have uh, inputted into the theorem is as follows. So these radii are increasing here, R1, R2, R3. And uh, there are these mystery regions, very small mystery regions from Rj to rj e to the pi over mj. So that should be 1, not j. Red is not very visible, Kirill. OK, let me, let me use a me. different color. Let me, use, uh, let me use green. r1 e to the pi over m1. Is that OK? Yes, much better. Yes, yes. OK. Yeah. So r2 e to the pi over m2, r3 e to the pi over m3, etc. cetera. Uh, so outside of these tiny green regions, uh, we know exactly what the entire function f does uh, up to the mapping phi. So in this first blue region here, for instance, f up to phi is given by uh, c1. I'll tell you what c1 is in a second, but it's not so important. Basically, it's just a monomial whose degree we've specified uh, at, at the start. And then there is this mystery green region. So I should say, and I haven't said, everything here is, is more or less radially symmetric. So I'm only saying what happens on the real line but uh, it, that specifies what happens, at least for the purposes of this talk, that specifies what happens uh, on the entire plane. Um, so right there's this mystery region. And then again, we know exactly what the mapping does up to the QC map um, phi. Again, it's a, a monomial whose degree we've specified at the, at the start and, uh, and so on. So just one more I'll write down. 
Uh, so basically, outside of these very small, mysterious green regions, we know exactly what the mapping does up to uh, the perturbation phi. Uh, so again, what I'm doing here is trying to describe the statement of, of the theorem. Uh, and there are a few more conclusions here. So first of all, what are these CJs? So C1, we get to specify as any non-zero complex number. But from there, the CJs are specified by this recursive relation. So the jth one is the j minus first one times this power of the jth radius, mj minus one times mj. So these are, are not particularly crucial. The formula comes from the fact that we want the, the monomial on either side of an rj to map that rj to the same radius. So the, the cj's are not so important. Uh, what is important is this estimate that we have that this homeomorphism phi is actually not too far from the identity, at least close to infinity. Uh, and before I forget to say this, this can be improved in practice, but at least in the general setting, uh, we can have this provided that the MJs increase sufficiently quickly, namely that their inverses are summable. Um, and I should say here, there are some extra assumptions, which I'll talk about uh, eventually. They're not very complicated, but there are some extra assumptions. And uh, lastly, and maybe most importantly, uh, the only singular values of the entire function f of f are the critical values plus or minus cj rj to the mj. Uh, right, so th this is uh, the, the statement of the theorem. So again, zoomed out, we're putting in some information and we're getting out an entire function more specifically. We have these two sequences, one represents powers uh, and the other represents radii. And basically we have uh, this freedom to transition from one degree uh, to the next. And we only need this very small amount of space to do it. Um, and let me just put in the extra assumptions now. They're not very complicated. So one, I won't write down, but you can see it from the picture. We need uh, R1 e to the pi over M1 to be less than R2. So th th this, is, this is not so serious uh, and I won't write it down. But the one that is uh, more serious is that we need the ratios of these powers to be uniformly bounded. Um, so this is uh, the entirety of uh, the statement of the theorem. Um, so I'll talk about uh, applications now, and um, then I'll talk about uh, the proof. Uh, but before I do that, if there's anything I can clear up, uh, just let me know. Okay, so applications for this theorem. So the original one that we always had in mind uh, was a uh, approach to uh, a result of uh, Chris Bishop's of um, existence of transcendental Julia sets of dimension one. Um, and uh, so, right, this, as I mentioned out loud, is originally a result of uh, Chris from just a few years ago. And this was our uh, original motivation. So Chris's original construction was via an infinite product. Uh, so let me say infinite product. <clears throat> and uh, our approach, which, uh, so th this part isn't quite written up yet. Um, and you should go to Jack's talk on Thursday where he will uh, talk about this. But just uh, briefly, uh, the approach is 
on an heuristic level is very similar to Chris's approach, kind of what do we want this entire function to look like if we're going to get to dimension one Julia set. Um, but on a level of details, it's uh, completely different. Uh, so his approach is with an infinite product, whereas ours is uh, via this theorem. And kind of more generally, one of our hopes, one of our broader hopes for this theorem is that it can, uh, in, in, in a place where one would usually uh, try and use an infinite product to prove that some entire function with some properties exists, uh, this is hopefully going to be a viable alternative if uh, the approach with the infinite products is, is difficult. And so this is a, a good example of that, that uh, this difficult construction of Julia sets of dimension one, transcendental Julia sets of dimension one, can be gotten uh, with this approach. And uh, so for details, you should uh, go to Jack's talk. This plus question mark, question mark is we can do better than uh, just dimension one transcendental Julia sets, but we're going to hold off on saying exactly what that better part is until we have it written down. Okay, uh, a more modest application, and this one we'll think of, we'll think of as a warm up, is a much older result due to Baker of the existence of multiply connected wandering domains. Um, so multiply connected uh, wandering domains. So since they're proven to exist by Baker, uh, they've been uh, somewhat well studied in the field. Um, uh, a, a good reference is the, the, the work by uh, Rippin and Stollard and uh, Bergweiler and Rippin and Stollard, uh, where they have a sort of classification of these things. Um, right, so how do we prove that they exist pretty easily with uh, this method is, well, uh, let's draw our picture, our positive real line. And again, everything is radially symmetric. So if these parameters satisfy the J plus first radius is CJ RJ to the MJ. Uh, so if these parameters that we started out with satisfy those uh, relations, uh, then what happens? So R1, R2, R3, et cetera. So the function F up to the perturbation phi, uh, if we have this relation, just maps one radius to the next. Um, and so we have these sort of uh, mysterious regions where we don't know exactly what happens, uh, but in between we have an exact description, right? That uh, the mapping F precomposed phi is just this uh, uh, monomial. And uh, so this mapping, what it does is we can see this blue region here uh, from, so this, this green point here is R1 e to the pi over M1. And that blue region, everything bigger but less than R2, it gets mapped inside of this next blue region uh, from uh, R2 e to the pi over m2 to R3, and, uh, and so on. So uh, this is what uh, the picture looks like for F precomposed with phi. Uh, but we're not interested in iterating f precomposed with phi. So the entire function is f, um, not f precomposed with phi. Uh, but what we can do is write the identity f is f precomposed with phi, precomposed with phi inverse. So this is the, the easiest identity you'll have to verify today. Um, and so iterating uh, f, it's the same thing as iterating uh, this mapping F precomposed with phi, which we know what it does pretty much everywhere, uh, plus this extra phi inverse term. And since I said already, we can get this conclusion that phi is pretty close to the identity near infinity, uh, provided that the MJs are summable, Uh, then uh, what we can do is just scale the picture slightly down to give us uh, a little bit of wiggle room inside these blue regions. So if we just scale the picture down a little bit, 
uh, what, what, and we consider these uh, regions, which are slightly shrinked versions of, or shrunken versions of the blue region. Uh, well, iterating F, it's the same thing as iterating F precomposed with free, precomposed with free inverse. And so phi inverse, it's just a small perturbation. Uh, so it doesn't move things around very much. That's coming from uh, this estimate that phi is close to the identity. Now, phi doesn't move things around very much, and we still have a little bit of wiggle room. So then when we apply F precomposed with phi, uh, it exactly gets mapped somewhere inside of the next blue region. And our wiggle room uh, is increased. And so again, in the next picture, we have this uh, shrunken version. And again, phi inverse uh, wiggles things around a little bit, but it doesn't do it too much because of this estimate of phi being close to the identity. And we get exactly this uh, multiply connected wandering domain picture. Um, so, it, it, uh, so here kind of the crucial point is that we have this identity, this trivial identity, um, and we know the fact that phi is close to the identity. Um, I'm using the word identity in two different senses there. Uh, so this kind of illustrates the, 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 the importance of um, this estimate uh, phi being close to the identity near infinity. Uh, and again, this is a warm up example. Uh, it doesn't really show off the theorem very well because uh, the kind of the, the theorem that one of the most important parts is the statement about the singular values of the function, which we don't use in that application whatsoever. Um, without the statement about the singular values, there are easier ways to go about trying to, to do this. Um, but one of the points is we know globally what happens everywhere to our function um, up to this mapping phi. And uh, in particular, we know exactly where the singular values are. Uh, so that's uh, one application. Third. So, sorry, you may sure. have a question. So uh -huh. you, you put a, a formula for the critical values, but where are located? It? Because I was lost about the constant, so I don't know exactly this. Cj minus one, this. So yeah, where so are the, they in this picture, the, the, the critical the, values? The critical values are exactly where the function sends rj. So this, this, uh, this is equal to f precomposed with phi of r j minus one. So it's just uh, the image of the j minus first radius. Uh, and this will become more evident once I, once I talk about the proof. In a no, but, and then the singular values? Uh, yeah, so th those are the singular values. Uh, it's exactly that sequence of critical values. But then they go to infinity? Oh, their, their behavior under the iteration of the no, mapping? I mean themselves. Yeah, so the, the critical values do uh, accumulate at infinity in this case. So this but, is not in the, the aramenko lubitsch class. To clarify that, you've not said anything explicit about the critical points, right? You're, you're, uh, that will maybe be buried in the construction or maybe you don't care, but what you do care about is, is that statement I, about the critical values? I, I do care about the critical points too, but I haven't gotten to it yet. So I, I, I will in a minute. Um, any, any, anything else I should clarify? Okay, uh, right. So uh, the third application is, uh, you know, kind of an entreaty. You know, we think there are other uses for this. Um, so, uh, we, we, you know, if so, you know, if if uh, uh, if you're thinking about some class of functions where the singular values accumulate in infinity and you need to construct something, uh, hopefully this might help. Um, right. So. From here, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, the proof, which will give a little bit more as to uh, what, what's really going on here. So basically, how do we prove the existence of these mappings f phi in the statement of the theorem? So let me copy paste it. Uh, just to be precise, right? So again, broadly speaking, we're given these two sequences and I'm telling you there exists uh, this mapping F, these mappings F and phi. So how, how do we come up with that? Uh, 
Uh, so our general strategy will be as follows. So the strategy, and so for now, this is just kind of trivial and I'll tell you when we get to something non-trivial. So we'll define uh, a function H as follows. Uh, it's going to be exactly what we want in uh, these kind of blue regions where I'm telling you we know exactly what uh, the entire function does up to the mapping fee. So z1, z to the m1, if mod z is less than or equal to r1, uh, then something happens, which I'll tell you about in a minute, between r1 and r1 e to the pi over m1. Then we switch to this higher degree monomial uh, if mod z is between r1 e to the pi over m1 and r2. And then again, uh, something happens, which uh, I'll tell you about in a minute, uh, and so on. So c3, z to the m3, etc. So we want to define uh, this function uh, such that h is quasi-regular on the entire plane so that by the measurable Riemann mapping theorem, uh, there exists uh, a quasi-conformal mapping phi of the plane such that when we pre-compose H with phi inverse, we get an entire function uh, and a holomorphic function. Um, so this is the strategy and I, so it's it's not trivial because we're applying the measure of blue room mapping theorem, but modulo the measure of blue room mapping theorem, this is trivial. I'm just trying to tell you uh, how generally we come up with uh, these mappings f and phi. So uh, the we, we define a function and then we apply the measure of blue room mapping theorem. So of course the, the main point is how do we come up with these definitions uh, which interpolate between these different uh, monomial mappings. So these question marks, these have to be pretty good interpolations because I'm telling you that you can go from looking like uh, z to the 100 to z to the 200 in a, a space of uh, r e to the pi over 2. So this very small, uh, sorry, not r e to the pi over 2, but rather r e to the pi over 100. So in this very small space, you can jump from uh, this monomial degree to this uh, larger monomial degree. Uh, so the main question here is uh, how do we interpolate between z to the n and z to the m. So how do we interpolate between different uh, power mappings? So this is where the, the title of uh, the talk and the paper comes from, is that uh, this is really what this strategy boils down to. Uh, and I don't really mean how do we interpolate between these mappings, but how do we interpolate efficiently between these mappings? Um, so of course, there are lots of different ways to interpolate between uh, these different power mappings. Um, but we need to do it uh, very efficiently. We only have this very small amount of space to do it in, and we need this function h to be quasi-regular, uh, which is, as, as I'm going to say in a minute, it means that we need uh, the dilatation of this interpolation to be uh, uniformly bounded um, so that we actually get a quasi-regular function, a function whose dilatation doesn't uh, uh, degenerate as you go off to infinity. So this is uh, what I'm going to talk about now for a little bit, is uh, kind of a general sketch of how do we interpolate between these power mappings. And uh, this is kind of where all, all of the effort in, in the paper is located. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So the main idea, so let's illustrate this now. 
So we'll talk about this in the case when uh, we're interpolating between z squared and z to the fourth, just to have uh, some concreteness in our discussion. So that's going to be our inner circle. This is going to be our outer circle. So in this inner one, we want z, z squared. And in this outer region, we want z, whoops, we want z to z to the fourth. And uh, how do we interpolate between these two uh, different mappings? Uh, so it's going to be useful to introduce the following combinatorics here. Uh, so what we have is um, we're going to uh, label pre-images of plus or minus one. So suppose this inner circle is of radius one, but it doesn't really matter uh, so that these two points are plus or minus one. So plus one is uh, a, a circle which is not filled in and minus one is a circle which is filled in. And similarly on this outer circle, we'll just label the points on that circle which intersect the real axis. So the pre-image uh, on the circles on the left, uh, the pre-images, well, over here, we have two pre-images of plus one and two pre-images of minus one. And on the outer circle, we have four pre-images of that uh, positive number. And we have four pre-images of that negative number located as such. And uh, this picture is supposed to illustrate that the outer circle, when we um, uh, quadruple angles, uh, the, the points get mapped as we've drawn them. And the inner circle, when we double angles, the points get mapped as we've drawn them. Um, so this is going to be important when we sketch this main idea now. Uh, so here, how, how do we define our interpolation in this in-between regions, in this in-between region? Uh, it's defined as follows. So what we have to do is define something in this in-between region here, uh, which interpolates between z squared on the inside and z to the fourth on the outside. So what we'll do is we'll draw the following. Uh, so we'll work with a region which is slightly different than the one that we started out with. We'll work with a region where there are two sort of antenna uh, attached to those uh, particular pre-images of minus one. Um, so we have a slightly modified region here, but again, it's still the same goal. We want to interpolate between z squared on the inside and z to the fourth on the outside. So the first thing that we'll do is uh, a quasi-regular step, which is going to map uh, as follows. So I'll, I'll first draw the picture and then I'll explain a little bit what's going on. So we want a homeomorphism of that left annulus region minus these two antenna to this actual annulus. So to kind of illustrate you know, how, how, how this is done and for other reasons, which will become evident in a minute, we're going to keep track of this by drawing a stick figure here. So the stick figure, when we map him under this mapping, what happens is he gets cut in half. Uh, so you know, just try and visualize this yourself, um, you know, how, how we can map uh, the, these two regions homeomorphically one to the other. Well, we can do it provided we're allowed to be two valued on these antenna. Um, so this is something we're, we're going to keep track of now. Um, and right, so it, this is actually not so difficult to write down completely explicitly what this mapping is when we uh, move to logarithmic coordinates. Uh, but uh, you know, th th this is what the mapping is. But just to say that 
you know, in, in, in factual proof and everything, we're not citing some abstracts, you know, just believe us that this map exists. It's actually very uh, explicit. So, um, right, from here, what we'll do next, again, the goal is to interpolate between these different power mappings. Uh, the goal that, or what we'll do next is just map by z to the fourth. So what happens when we map by z to the fourth is, well, we get exactly this picture. Uh, all of those uh, vertices that we've drawn get mapped uh, to real points, right? Angles are uh, quadrupled. And let's keep track of what happens to this stick figure. Uh, well, if we move along here, we go along the top of the circle. And then uh, if we keep going, we're on the bottom. So this guy, uh, his top half is now sitting on the bottom and his bottom half is sitting on the top. Uh, and so what we want is an interpolation uh, on the entire annulus, not the annulus minus these antenna. So what we need to do is we need to get a single valued function uh, across this antenna. So what we do is uh, we're going to somehow have to identify either parts, uh, the top half and bottom half of this uh, inner circle. Yeah, well, sorry, uh, we can't see the red very well again. Okay. Uh, let me draw him in a different color then. Let me draw him in yellow. And in yellow here. And in yellow here. Okay, Great. so uh, this last step is um, we need to identify this two, the, this, uh, these two values so that we get a single valued function. And uh, the way we do that is in this, in some region around uh, this uh, this inner circle, what we do is uh, you know just squish things down. So it's it's not so hard to imagine that we can do this quasi conformally. Again, this is one of those things which I'm going to just ask you to believe that we can do this, but it's written down completely explicitly in the paper, uh, and it's going to be something which is the identity on this outside part of the blue region. And it's going to squish things uh, down so that uh, the top half and bottom half get identified. And so uh, the stick figure is now going to be happy again because he's reattached. And we have now a single valued function. Uh, so here I have to uh, clarify that really what we're doing is not what I've drawn, which is kind of post composing uh, the entire function that we've just defined in the first two steps by this squishing down function. But what we're really doing is as follows. So we have this blue region, which uh, neighbors the inner circle here. And when we pull it back under z to the fourth, what we get is some region, again, which kind of neighbors the inner circle. And when we pull it back again, we get something which neighbors the inner circle plus these antenna that we've added on. Uh, so uh, what I want to clarify is that the function that we're defining, uh, we're only modifying it in this way with this squishing down in these uh, blue regions, which uh, the part of the blue regions which neighbor the antenna that we've added. Um, so in the blue regions which neighbor uh, the original arcs of the Euclidean circle, we're not modifying it at all. We're only modifying the function to get the single valuedness in uh, these neighborhoods of, um, whoops, I didn't mean to do all that, in uh, these neighborhoods of the antenna. So 
Uh, right. So this is uh, the general sketch of the, the function. So first of all, I should re remember before I forget this first step here. Uh, the, the inverse of this mapping is what uh, Chris Bishop calls the folding map for uh, kind of obvious reasons. If you can visualize it is that uh, two edges on the right are getting folded onto one edge uh, on the left picture. Uh, so if, if you want to hear about that more, you should uh, go to uh, Chris's talk tomorrow, or you should go to it anyway. Um, and so, right, so this is kind of the general setup of uh, our sketch. How do we interpolate between z squared and z to the fourth? And uh, right, so the, the point and the reason this is a paper and takes quite a bit of effort is the key fact is that uh, the dilatation of the interpolation between z to the n and z to the m in uh, annulus uh, 1 to e to the pi over n depends only on the ratio m over n. So, you know, I just gave you one explicit interpolation between z squared and z to the fourth, and there's some quasi-regularity there, right? So not everything we're doing here is holomorphic. Um, so there's lots of stuff here, you know, the squishing down, uh, this homeomorphism, lots of these things are not holomorphic. So there's some dilatation. Uh, and the amount of dilatation that we need uh, only depends on the ratio four divided by two. So if we wanted to interpolate between z to the 97 and z to the 150 in the same annulus, uh, we wouldn't need any more dilatation because uh, 150 divided by 97 is less than or equal to four over two. Um, so all that matters there is uh, that is the ratio. So how much are you increasing this degree by uh, when you want to jump up from a monomial of one degree to a monomial of the next degree? So that's why we have this assumption, which I said was really crucial, that these powers that we had at the start of the theorem, we needed their ratios to be uniformly bounded. Uh, exactly because if they're not uniformly bounded, then the dilatation of this interpolation that we're defining is going to degenerate. May I ask so, something? Uh, may I ask him, may, um, may I ask him okay. about your construction? Uh, sure. if you, yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. That with reference to that picture, right? So, so I could imagine, not to say I could do it, but I could imagine uh, if all you really wanted to do was just interpolate uh, between those two powers and get some bound, you could just there, you, there might be some soft uh, uh, thing you could do you know, quote unquote, writing something down, right? But instead you're going through this rather elaborate and clever folding and unfolding, which uh, has a little detour into discontinuous functions and coming back. So there's some square roots or something going on there. And uh, at, the, at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're producing something which is a quasi-regular, what branch cover of the annulus, branch covering the, uh, the disc or something like that. Uh, yeah, okay. correct. Um, so there must, I mean, maybe this is what, maybe this is, uh, the point of what's to come, but I mean, the, I'm just, I'm wondering the rationale for doing it this with the folding and unfolding is just to get that particular bound M over N, as opposed to there being like some bound that's a function of M and N, uh, um, yeah, for yeah, example. So, yeah. Yeah. So the, the key point here is not just getting the bound, which depends only on the ratio M divided by N, but also that we can do it in this small space. Uh, so uh, if, uh -huh. if you if you let yourself have whatever amount of space that you want, then this is trivial to do. Or if you don't care about the bound of the dilatation, this is trivial to do. Uh, oh, but, I see. That was actually what was contained in your last comment about tracing around the uh, that well, putting in that blue region where where, where things are really happening, right? right? And then and then outside that is the, your fee is the identity. Is that what you're saying? Or uh, fee, fee is not the identity, but fee, fee is but, close um, to the identity. Uh, so the interpolation, you mean? Well, yeah, whatever. I mean, there's something you were saying that that 
the important, the, 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 the tricky bit that sort of requires you uh, or motivates you to do this, this folding and unfolding had to do with, with uh, the blue region close in as opposed to the outer boundary, right? Isn't that? Yeah, so there, there will be kind of dilatation uh, everywhere here because, so the first step um, is, 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 is going to be piecewise linear and logarithmic coordinates, and it's going to have uh, dilatation uh, everywhere in that region. Um, but I, I mean, I, I, the, the question is kind of, I guess, is there, uh, what, like, what's the motivation for doing it this way versus some other maybe more straightforward way? So if if I, not I, to say that I know another straightforward right, way, right. but my interest is peaked. Is is, is that's yeah. all? The... Yeah. So I, I mean, uh, if if you can prove this technical lemma uh, another way, I would be very interested and disappointed uh, at the same time. But I, I I don't think you can. I think uh, it, this is in in a way that it's to interpolate generally between these two different degree mappings in this fixed amount of space. I don't think you can do better than what we're doing. Uh, so, I mean, you can do better in the sense of getting some bounds slightly, you know, but in, in a soft sense, you can't do better. The whole point of this is when we have this quasi-regular mapping that we're defining here, um, as soon as the ratio of the MJs are bounded, uh, now that lemma tells us that uh, this interpolation region, uh, the dilatation is uniformly bounded over all of those different regions. Uh, and so there we can apply the, the measurable Riemann mapping theorem. Um, so I, 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 I don't think that uh, there's, there's um, a significantly different uh, way to go. So maybe there are significantly different ways of going about doing it, but I don't think there's one which is, which is easy. Um, so let, let me move on because I do want to talk about a couple other things uh, in the last 10 minutes or so. so First of all, uh, there are two really important conclusions I haven't talked about yet. How do we know that phi is close to the identity? And how do we know the only singular values of f are uh, these points? So the singular values part is easier to explain um, if we just look at our picture. So what are the critical points uh, in this picture? Well, the critical points are exactly going to be where we attach these antennas. So it's going to be these two points. And if you just follow through with the definitions, what happens to those two points? Uh, well, they get mapped two to one uh, at, uh, around their image. So this can be seen if we trace a circle around here, around this sort of uh, inner circle plus the antenna. What happens in the image is, uh, well, we start along uh, the upper part of that circle. But then as soon as we reach our antenna, what the definition tells us is that we go back uh, uh, downwards, not along the bottom part of the unit circle, but straight across the real line. And then when we come around the other side of that antenna, we go back to where we started. And then now, because we're traversing again along that inner circle, we go back to the unit circle and, and so on. So if you just follow through the definitions, topologically, the only place that this quasi-regular function is two to one is where we're attaching these antenna. Um, and so I should mention that uh, there's a more elaborate way of, of attaching these antenna in the general setting. So all I've talked about is z squared and z to the fourth. Uh, you know, but for instance, I have a picture here, a slightly more elaborate version is, in, which is uh, illustrated in our paper is, between z squared and z to the sixth here. So here, our antenna get to be a little bit more elaborate. And you can imagine that in general, there has to be some sort of systematic way of doing this. I think this answers my question very sharply. This is really what I was, I just sort of waited for it. This is, this okay. is why you're doing it. This gives you okay. the control to place the, um, same, the critical values. Right, yeah, so I mean, if, if yeah, if you wanted to just hit it with some sort of approximation theory technique, then you, you, you can do that, but you won't know anything about what the, the entire function does in these regions where you're applying, you know, uh, Runge's theorem or, or whatever version of Runge's theorem it is. Um, okay, so, right. so that's the singular value statement because, you know, topologically we know 
exactly from our construction what the function uh, does. And we know exactly where the function is locally two to one or where it's locally univalent. So that's that explanation. The other one, which I really wanted to also talk about is why is phi close to the identity near infinity? Uh, and this I think is a really beautiful application of the teichmuller wittig Belinsky theorem, which I will uh, tell you why I am making that statement in a second. So how do we deduce this conclusion V of z over z minus one goes to zero as z goes to infinity. Uh, well, here we have, remember what phi is, it's uh, this mapping which corrects the, the quasi-regular mapping that we've come up with. So phi is this quasi-conformal mapping, it's defined everywhere on the sphere, and uh, in particular in a neighborhood of infinity. And the only place where this mapping fails to be conformal is the only place where this quasi-regular mapping is not holomorphic. And that's exactly in these interpolation regions, which as I told you, these interpolation regions are living on annuli of uh, which are very, very thin, right? So the only place where this guy is uh, not conformal, we'll put it in this red region. The inner circle is supposed to be a Euclidean circle as well. This is, uh, let me put it big in red. Um, so this is something like RJ e to the, no, RJ, between RJ and RJ e to the pi over MJ, right? So these guys are converging down to infinity, but they're very, very, very thin, um, depending on how quickly mj uh, increases. So uh, what uh, the teichmiller wittig belinsky theorem says is, so first of all, if phi was conformal in a neighborhood of infinity, then uh, this um, estimate would be obvious. It would just come from normalizing the power series expansion of that conformal mapping correctly in a neighborhood of infinity. So we would get something even stronger than this statement. Um, but uh, so what the, okay, so what the teichmiller wittig belinsky theorem says is, okay, even if your mapping is not uh, conformal in a neighborhood of infinity, but if it's quasi-conformal and the place where it's not conformal is really, really small in some sense, then you still have uh, this estimate, which you get in the conformal setting. So uh, let me say that verifying uh, hypotheses, hypotheses of the teichmuller wittig belinsky theorem turns into verifying uh, that a certain integral is finite. So the integral is mod z less than r. So here r is some small number. And the integral is a certain dilatation or dilation minus one divided by mod z squared with respect to area measure. So we need to verify that this is finite. That's what the teichmiller wittig belinsky theorem says, uh, that uh, if you can verify this is finite, then you get this estimate where d is uh, the following. So c sub z of z where C is just going to be uh, normalization for the mapping phi. So we're just going to invert everything because the statement of the teichmiller wittig belinsky theorem, it's not about points at the point infinity, it's about the point zero. So just normalizing everything correctly, we get this. Uh, so this is the usual uh, dilation or dilatation quantity that we look at when we look at quasi-conformal mappings. So we need to verify that this is finite. And in this particular example, uh, or in this general setup, what happens uh, is that this turns into something which up to a constant is bounded by, uh, so first of all, uh, when phi is conformal, uh, that D 
quantity is just one because the z bar derivative vanishes. So we're integrating something which is non-zero uh, only. So the, the thing what we're integrating is non-zero only over these red regions uh, where the dilatation is non-zero. And so when we do this out in a very kind of obvious way, this integral turns into, uh, we need to verify that the following sum is finite. Uh, so just some constant, okay, I'll factor out the constant one over mod z squared dA of z. And this is up to a constant just equal to something very simple. So again, when we bound this in the obvious way, we get e to the two pi over mj minus one, summing this up, and this is finite if and only if the mj's are summable. So that last part is just a, a calculus exercise. Um, so the, and the reason I say this is, I think, a really beautiful application of the Teichmuller Riddick Walensky theorem is that the, the theorem is kind of, has kind of this technical hypothesis of you need to verify that some integral is finite. But in this particular setting, it turns into something much, much simpler. You, you, we just need the degree of these monomials to increase uh, sufficiently quickly. Namely, they, they need to be summable. So it's very simple. And the last thing I'll say is just that it's also kind of very surprising at first glance that uh, this estimate or this integral being finite doesn't depend whatsoever on the parameters rj. So you know you would think increasing the parameters rj, you're pushing more dilatation near infinity. So it's kind of being less conformal near infinity. But somehow the way that this integral is weighted or the function that we're integrating is weighted, the rj is completely disappeared. Um, so th th this, I think, is at least quite surprising at first glance. And this is the last thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, and so that's more or less a sketch of uh, the proof of the theorem. And if you want to know about the dimension one application, you should go to Jack's talk on those. So th thanks again for your attention. Thank you for a very nice talk. Let's thank um, Kevin.